For those of you who use those envelopes for your offering, they can be located on any one of those tables there in the lobby area. Make sure you pick those up today so you can have those and put, implement them for your tithes and offerings. I do want to bring attention to our flowers that we have on our offering table this morning. They're in memory of Nathan Hales, and we ask that you continue to keep uh, Miss Mildred and Cooper and Allison and the whole family in your prayers in the passing of Nathan. Um, do also want to reflect that we do have a men's breakfast coming up. We also have a women's embrace uh, meeting coming up as well, as well as an adult luncheon and a prayer walk. Those dates and times are where? In your bulletin. <laughs> so check those out. Stay in tune with what the different events that are coming up. And just be in prayerful uh, consideration of being part of that. One other thing I do want to state, since it's the first of the year, uh, keep in prayer our pastor search committee, our efforts, and that God will bless us in this endeavor. It is that time for us to start working on that. Uh, know that your elders, your deacons, we are working to implement that and get things in place. But first and foremost, we need God to be in it. So please be in prayer. Keep that in your mind, the forefront, and be in prayer for consideration of how you might can help with that. Other than that, I think uh, Nathan's, uh, Ethan's got a uh, comment for us there on the, on the youth. All right. Okay, so 2024 has brought some change in probably everybody's life, including me and Rebecca's. So we are now the youth pastors here at KMBC. We're excited. We're going to whip these kids into shape. <laughs> I don't know if you're clapping for that or not, but that's good. I appreciate it either way. Uh, next Sunday, we want to uh, borrow a few minutes of your time after the service. It's not a business meeting. It's nothing formal. It's just a time with all the youth parents uh, or concerned parties for that matter to state your concerns, meet us. Uh, we're going to give you our expectations of y'all and the youth, and you can give uh, us your expectations of us and just air your grievances or add anything you'd like to add. Just your time for your voice to be heard. Uh, this new year coming up and new things we've got planned. We're going to try to get the schedule out uh, and the calendar and just get everybody on the same page starting moving forward. And uh, yeah, we look forward to serving with y'all. We look forward to serving with the youth, and we're excited to be here. So uh, hang around next Sunday after service for 10, 15 minutes. Won't be long. Make sure we get you in line before Storm and Normans. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. God, we do thank you and praise you for this day to be in your house, Lord. And as we continue to work into the start of a new year, Lord, we ask that you would be with us and strengthen us and provide for us, Lord. And may throughout the year, whatever the situation, whether in our church family or in our own personal lives, that we would remember to call upon you, to seek you, and to trust you in all that you do. Lord, we ask now that you be in the service from the music, from those who are prepared to bring forth the message, Lord, all these things, we ask that you would be in it and that you would be glorified, Lord. We ask these things in your name and your name alone. Amen. All right, go ahead and stand with us as we lift up the name of Christ this morning through song. Excited to see everybody here. All of our songs revolve around Jesus and his holiness this morning, so we're excited to worship that. Go ahead and begin singing with us. prophet Isaiah had a vision of the Lord, and this is what he said. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Sing with us.
Ushers, come on forward, and then we're going to have the teen group have a special for you. Thank you for singing with us today. 
Hey, good morning again, and uh, for those that are joining us online, thank you for uh, tuning in. If you would, bow your heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a nice, warm, sunny day. Um, you know, sometimes we ask for a lot of rain, and then we don't want it to rain, and we can be very fickle, so forgive us for um, where sometimes we ask for stuff that we just don't know what we're asking. Father, we know that you are always looking after us, and we just have to be patient and follow your will. Father, take these tithes and offerings and multiply them tenfold, Father, for the missions of work and for just turning the lights on, paying salaries, whatever is needed of these monies, tithes, and offerings, Father. We just uh, trust that you uh, will give us continued opportunities in this coming year to be good stewards of what you give us. Thank you for your love and your grace. Amen.
Thank you, guys. Good job. Good job. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning and Happy New Year. And I hope the New Year is treating you well. It's good to have you all with us. And uh, those who are online today, appreciate your being here with us. And I pray God will be glorified in everything that's said and done. And in our thoughts today, if you haven't under, uh, figured it out already, um, a good portion of the, the sermon day is going to be on holy. Uh, so we have sung about it, and now we need to study about it in our Bibles. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. I told somebody earlier, I just gave you three verses today. Uh, so it's not a lot to uh, look at and really stress our brains about necessarily. And I should be able to do this sermon in 20 minutes, but don't count on it. All right. So let's pray. Oh, Father God, you are definitely holy. Lord, we don't even understand what that means so much in our daily lives. We read this morning from Isaiah where he comes before the throne room of God and is totally undone. He's out of his wits because he stands in the presence of an almighty, just, holy God who's totally righteous and pure, who's so brilliant uh, that he can't take it in. He, he just bows down. He, he's undone, he says. He's a man of unclean lips. He sees his sinfulness. He sees his wretchedness before Almighty God. And we would be the same way today, Lord, if we stood directly in your presence. But Lord, you sent your son to die for us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and to make us holy to make us dedicated and set apart for, for, for your service, Lord. You've, you've allowed us to be able to enter the throne room of heaven because we have a high priest now, the Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us, who's paid the price of our sins, and, and we can come stand before Almighty God and, and realize that, that, that our sins are forgiven and that we're accepted in the beloved and and uh, your righteousness, your sanctification, your holiness, your justification fills us. Not because we did anything, but because you have done it. You know, that's the good news. That's the gospel today. That we're saved by your grace. We give you thanks and we worship you and pray, Lord, today in everything that you would be preeminent. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. We're beginning our study. We're going to spend a, a few weeks maybe in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I like this book. So I thought maybe I'd give you a little background and introduction uh, for it today. Uh, you could characterize the city of Corinth uh, as the sin city probably of the Roman Empire. Uh, Las Vegas would probably uh, place a distant second uh, to... Uh, to Corinth, uh, and even San Francisco and New York City probably. Corinth, if you can see on the map here, is, is, uh, is it's a port city and it's on a little isthmus, a little strip of land that separates two bodies of water. But it, 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 it was a very uh, significant port because it cut out a lot of travel. Ships could pull into one side of that little isthmus, unload your cargo, ship it across to the other side, and, and, and go on, and, and not have to sail all the way around that lower part of, of Greece there. And so it was a well-known city, uh, had about 400,000 inhabitants in that day and time, which is a lot uh, in Paul's day. It was multicultural, uh, had, a, had a grandiose, spectacular temple dedicated to Aphrodite, or in the Latin version, Venus, the goddess of love. Uh, but this was not the kind of love you and I are talking about. This is not uh, agape love. This is sensual love. There were a thousand priestesses, or prostitutes is basically what they were, who served in this temple. Uh, they uh, practiced and engaged in a lot of immoral sexual uh, practices. It was a temple of fornication. <laughs> it, was, it was bad, bad stuff. Uh, this, this city was given over to debauchery. I 
thought about that word while I was preparing this. That's a neat word, debauchery. <laughs> uh, but basically, that's, that's moral depravity. These people were depraved. Uh, you know, I think about, when I think about our own situation today, I think about the gay parades that we're having throughout the country today, New York City and San Francisco, and we don't see on tev television normally what's going on there, but there's all kinds of debauchery going on during those parades. People are doing all kinds of fornication, all kinds of stuff, and uh, it, it, it's a terrible thing. I think of uh, Corinth, I think of uh, three, three, three L words that I like to use a lot. Lewd, lascivious, and licentious. Uh, go look them up if you want to, but it means immoral, bad stuff. Uh, and that's what it was. In fact, there was a, a, a phrase coined uh, to really, if you were really a bad, depraved person, they would say that uh, you were a Corinthianizer. Uh, this city got associated with all kinds of, of, of moral depravity. In Acts 18, verses 1 through 18, Paul stays there in Corinth for 18 uh, months. He meets Aquila and Priscilla there. Maybe you're familiar with them. And Paul, Paul preaches in the synagogue and a riot results. You know, everywhere Paul preached, there was a riot, a revolution, a revival. Something happened. You know, and, and I, Oh, I, I hunger for that. I, I wish when, when we preached, when we gathered, there'd be something. Uh, there'd be a moan or a groan or something coming out of us. Uh, not, not long after Paul left Corinth, uh, they, they began having problems. The Holy Spirit came to Corinth in a powerful way. And we'll, we'll, we'll understand this as we read through this letter. Uh, they, they, held, they, were, they were held back in no gift. God poured out his spirit on these pe people. Paul said that he didn't come with, with fancy sounding words or well thought, thought out logic, although there was some of that. But he, he came in the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so that's, that's how this church came into being. Uh, but, but after he left, they began to slouch back into their, their pagan ways, their pagan uh, lifestyle. They, they, they were very prideful people, and the pride swelled up. In fact, Paul says, you're puffed up. Uh, you, you're, you're so prideful. And when you're prideful, you, you, can't, you can't listen too well. You, you think you know all the answers. Uh, they had conflicts in the church, and not only were they in the church, they made them public. Uh, they were talking around town. Uh, and gossiping about the church. There was, a, there was a situation of incest in the church, and they just ignored it. Uh, they thought they were past those things. and didn't have to worry. it. They, they misunderstood and misapplied uh, and misused the spiritual gifts that God had poured out on this church. And there was a lot of disagreement and confusion over the teachings that Paul had given to them. Uh, and that was causing divisions. This church had started off so well, but now it, it was in a mess. And so they write uh, to Paul a letter. And uh, Paul responds to that letter. In fact, this is actually the second letter that, that he used. The first letter he, we ha he, he wrote to them, uh, we, we, we've lost. We do not know where that is. Uh, so uh, there's so much pride and confusion and divisiveness and immorality in this church. It, it reminds me a lot of the church today uh, in our world, in our nation, that is beginning to accept all kinds of immoral uh, teachings and values and uh, is divided and who do not believe that the Bible is the word of God and do not stand on Christ Jesus as the foundation. Uh, so... There, there are a lot of reasons for this division and this immorality and this divisiveness, but primarily it comes down to the fact that the church does not know her Savior. The church as a whole. And I pray and hope in this sanctuary this morning, we know our Savior. Sanctuary, that's another word for holy. This is a holy place, a place that's supposed to be set aside, set apart. Now, there's nothing spectacular about this room. But when we gather as God's people, we're the church, we're his people gathered together. We're the body of Christ, and that makes this gathering holy, Amen. set apart, set aside. <clears throat> so, the fact is, we don't know our Savior. We know about Jesus. 
Oh, a lot of us can recite a lot of facts about Jesus, but we don't know Jesus. We don't know Jesus because we don't have, many of us, intimate talks with him daily. We don't have intimate listening sessions. Just quit the talking and listen. We, we, we don't know Jesus today because we don't hear his voice because we don't listen. His voice is closed up between the two covers of our Bibles. We need to study the word to show ourselves approved. Back when we had Awanas, that was... Uh, one of the key statements that we said. We started a new year. I hope, I hope and pray that, that all of us have dedicated ourselves this year to getting into the Word of God. I, I, I passed out a sheet or two last week of ways you can go through the Bible and read through uh, at your own leisure, really, but, but read through in a year, read through in less than a year. And I encourage you to do that this year. Listen, we need Jesus. We need to open up our Bibles, and we need to realize that this is his word, and we need to feast on the word of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from, from God. We pay lip service to him. Now listen, I'm talking to myself this morning. Too much lip service. We do a few good deeds and we think that that, 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 that that'll be sufficient, that that's God, that that's all God desires, that's all God requires. Just, let's just come to church occasionally, maybe even come on a Wednesday night occasionally and uh, read our Bible a little bit and, and that'll satisfy God. We don't honor, we don't esteem the one who in actuality we cannot live without. We can't be a church, folks, without Jesus. Major theme of, of this book of Corinthians is the supremacy and lordship of Jesus Messiah, Jesus the Christ, must be the essence or must be the foundation of the church. And not just as individuals. Here's a problem. We've got some people in this church, I'm sure, who are devout Christians who study the Word and pray and seek God and seek to love Him with all their heart. But, but it's for the whole body yeah. who make up the, the body of Christ, make up the church, the body of Christ. We need to come together and, and be united. We need to work together and, and pull together to build up the body. If, if one part of the body is aching, then the, all the parts of the body is aching. We needed. We need to be united in our desire to be holy, to be sanctified, to be set apart for God. Paul uses this uh, preeminence, the supremacy, the lordship of Jesus Christ in many of his epistles. It's essential because Jesus is the answer to our problems, individually and corporately. We need a pastor. We need somebody to come in here that's that's God's person to lead us and guide us. But he's got to love God. He's got to know God. And and we need the right person. We need to pray. pray. Amen. Need to be in his word. We need Jesus. He can bring harmony out of chaos. He can bring reconciliation out of conflicts. You know, I I was thinking about this this this, this recently. We talk about Christmas as being uh, Jesus is the reason for the season. Oh, yeah, amen, hallelujah. Jesus is the reason for everything. Everything. It's not just during Christmas, New Year's. Every day that's coming, Jesus is the reason. So we need to trust him for anything, for everything. And we must include him in every thought. That we have. Now that's a hard thing to do, but it's something we should try to achieve. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, listen, folks, every one of us in here walk in the flesh. 
I don't know about you, but I'm in a fleshly body. <laughs> I'm walking, still talking, and I'm in the flesh. That we can't help that. But we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. We've got the Spirit of God indwelling in us. And we don't need to get caught up in all these little fleshly wars and battles and gossip in the world. We need to rise above that, is what this is saying. We need to be led of the Spirit of God. And our weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, if we would think more about God every day and more about Jesus, and if we'd be in his word to, to, to the point where we know some of his word and we can recall it, and the spirit of God that indwells us can bring those thoughts up and bring those things to mind as we're going through life, uh, we, we, we will be able to overcome. We will be able to pull down strongholds. Everything that's high, the world considers high, can be uh, brought down by the knowledge of God. If we take God's word and take it captive, we've got to fill our mind with Jesus, with the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Jesus should be our dearest, nearest friend. Saw somebody uh, working on their husband just now, primping them up and getting them ready. <laughs> Jesus needs to primp us up. Jesus needs to get us ready. And our wives do too. And husbands likewise, the wives. The, the problem with the church at Corinth is, is they had lost sight. They weren't seeking him in the problems that they were facing. They had lost their first love. Today, folks, we often lose sight of the lordship of Jesus. Oh, we know about Jesus, we talk about Jesus, but is he lord? Is he the master? Is he the king of your life? We misunderstand today how crucial the cross is to, to the mission and to the message and to the methodology of the church, the way we do things, the way we operate. You know, folks, we should really be on our knees about our pastor, about the direction God wants this church to go in. We need to be on our knees to support Ethan and Rebecca and others in our church and, and the music people, Donna and all the rest of them. Uh, we need to be praying and seeking God and praying for the new lady who's coming in uh, as our administrative assistant. Pam, I believe, is her name. We, we need to be lifting these people up. We're in a spiritual battle today, and the church needs to stand up. And that's why the study of this uh, epistle to the first Corinthians, I believe, will, will help aid and direct and guide us if, if, as we seek this pastor and seek the mission of our church. So, you're probably sitting there saying, well, why, why, why haven't we started? <laughs> well, let's start. Verse 1, this is a salutation. Paul uses these to, in every letter he writes. He says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Sosthenes, we believe, was the guy who was the uh, ruler of the synagogue. And, and uh, when, 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 when the synagogue, many, pe many people in the synagogue got saved and came to know Jesus, and they drug Sosthenes out and beat him up. Uh, so evidently he's still around. Uh, but this says, call, Paul called to be an apostle. Well, in, in my Bible, uh, the New King James Version, that to be is in italics. And when a word is in italics in that Bible, it means that word really isn't in the original language. So what this should really say is Paul called an apostle. It's not a matter that Jesus called Paul and said, Paul, I want you to be an apostle. And Paul says, all right, Lord, I'm going to go out and be an apostle. I'm going to go out and work this thing up. I'm going to get this thing done. I'm going to be an apostle. No. If God didn't call him an apostle, he could work his whole life. He'd never be an apostle. 
not an apostle of God. God called him. Paul needs to, to act like an apostle. He definitely needs to conduct himself in a way that an apostle would, uh, would conduct himself. But he couldn't do anything unless God called him. God called him and he stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus. And, and Paul bowed down before God and, and confessed him as his Lord and Savior. It's the same thing for you and me. If you're a Christian, God has to call you. If you're a Christian this morning, I can assure you God called you. The word, the word in the Bible is also referred to as an election. He elected you. The word election just means he, he called you out of. He called you out of, his, uh, out of darkness into his marvelous light, says in Peter. So God called you. He called me. God has to draw us. None of us will seek after God. Romans chapter 3, verse 11 We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And none of us is righteous. This no, righteous, no, not one. And none of us seeks after God. You say, well, wait a minute. I know people that seek after God. No. No. None of us seek after God in the sense that that thought about God, seeking God, originates within ourselves. It doesn't originate within us. God plants it. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit calls us, and we just respond. Basically what we do, it's a gift of God. We just say, thank you. Thank you, I'll trust you, I'll believe. I, I, I put my faith in you, but you know what's so neat about all this is even our faith is a gift of God. Everything is God's working in you and me. God makes it happen. It doesn't happen because of our own initiative. It's a time for a thank you Jesus moment. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God saved me when I wasn't worthy to be saved. Couldn't save myself. Just made myself deeper and deeper in debt in a sense to my sin. And it's time to worship God because he called us. I'm saved because God desired for me to be saved. You're saved because God desired for you to be saved. God willed for you to be saved. And listen to this, any time, this might be a, a terrible English sentence, I don't know. Any time we can say we are something, or we can say we are doing something, because God wills it to be, or God wills it to be done, that's a wonderful feeling. That's a satisfying state of affairs. If you know that where you are right now, who you are right now, is, is, is God made you that. Or if you know that whatever you're doing now is because God uh, put you that, God gave you the ability to do that, God called you to do that, and you're in God's will, friend, that should be a place of total assurance. Yeah. Are you a teacher? Are you a former teacher? talking with some of you today. Are you a custodian? <laughs> are you retired? Are you a fireman? Are you a salesperson? Are you an engineer? Are you an IT person, a musician? Are you a farmer? Are you a mechanic? Are you a preacher? Well, if you are, and you know that God desires for you to be that thing, and God desires for you to be where you are today, and you know that, it doesn't matter what's happening around you because you're in God's will. No matter if the situation's good or the situation's bad, no matter if it's difficult or smooth or bumpy, you, you can have a deep contentment, a deep satisfaction that, 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 that you're in the will of God and everything's going to work together for good. Problem is we jump ahead of God too often. We go do things without making sure God wants us to do. That's why it's so important for us to pray <laughs> that God's will be done in our selection of a pastor. Everything we do here, the budget, 
How much do we pray over the budget? I'm going to tell you what, folks. I didn't pray a lot over the budget. I don't even think I've seen one yet. Now, that's terrible. Lord, forgive me. Anyway. Verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, notice this. The church is at Corinth, but the church is in Christ. It's not a building. It's not necessarily an organization. It can be. Just because we call ourselves Kenley Missionary Baptist Church does not mean we are a church. Just because we got a building, just because we got chairs, just because we got an organization, it does not mean that we're a church. Just like Paul couldn't make himself an apostle, he had to be called. We can't make ourselves a church without Jesus Christ. We, we, we can't be a church. In fact, in that matter, we can't even be a Christ, Christian unless we are in Christ. That's a favorite expression of the Apostle Paul. W what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be in Christ? I think there's a lot of confusion over that today. I think, folks, hopefully not talking about a person in here, but I probably am, that there are too many people today who believe they're Christians and really aren't. Because we're not acting like it. We don't bear that fruit. What does it mean to be in Christ? I think it's summed up well in Philippians 3.8. And as I read this, ask yourself, is this who you are? This, this is what it means to be in Christ. Philippians 3.8-10 through 10, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Count them as garbage. Count them as filthy rags that I may gain Christ. There's nothing in my life I want more than Jesus. There's nothing in my life I put before Jesus. That's what it means to be in Christ. And you see, I think today we've compromised this. We think we give God a little time at church. We give God a little time in Bible study or something. Then, hey, I'm in Christ. No, no. You're only in Christ because God put you in Christ. But if you're in Christ, then you should desire, and I should desire, what Paul is talking about here. He says, I count, I count all things as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found, where? In Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Here's another thing. A lot of us think, think, think we're so... Christian and we're so righteous we look down on everybody else and we want to condemn everybody else and that's not God there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus there's concern for others I don't have my own righteousness which is from the law there is no righteousness which is from the law because we cannot obey the law we fail but that which is through faith in Christ. My righteousness comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is of, from God by faith. He says that I may know him. I want, I want to know Jesus more than I know anything else. And I, I want to know the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You know, if you know the power of his resurrection, you can be conformed to his death. If you know the minute you die, you're going to be resurrected. You're going to go live with God. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. When you know that, folks, you, you're willing to go to any length to serve God. This is what it means to me to be in Christ. Is this your desire? Is this Now, I don't live up to this like I should, but this is my desire are you in Christ Jesus? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you counted all things at loss or, or, or as nothing so that you can know him intimately? Are you willing to suffer whatever it takes for Jesus? Be willing to die. This is what I was talking about a while ago. If God has called us, called us to be a Christian, and we're in Christ, then, 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 
then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if the whole world's against me. If I know in my heart Christ is for me. And I'm willing to do whatever he wants me to do. That's where I want to be. Am I there yet? No. But that's where I want to be. And that's what it means, I believe, to be in Christ. I want to be there. Martin Luther King said, if a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, he's not fit to live. Whoa. If a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, he's not fit to live. Are you willing to die? Do you truly trust Jesus? Do you know that he indwells you by the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is convicting you and convicting me. God desires for you to have an intimate relationship with him. He, he wants to dwell in you. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. You know, as human beings, we're body, soul, and spirit. And we put a, a lot of emphasis on the body because we're in the body. We're, we're carnal. But the spirit and the soul are, are an equal part of us. And, and God is, is three parts. And, and part of him is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, is, when we become a Christian, indwells. He comes to abide with us. But we need to open up our spirit to his spirit that we can be in unity with the spirit of God. And, and the spirit of God wants to commune with you and me. And so we, we, we need to get our spirits, you know, <laughs> together on the same spiritual plane. I don't think we talk enough about the spirit of God in, in the church, the, our spirit. And this is what this book is talking about. It's going to be talking a lot about spiritual things. I want us to know spiritual things. I don't want us to hold back on anything. I don't want any of us to sit here and say, or, 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 or that can't happen. Or that stuff's old stuff. Doesn't happen today. I want us to be open to God's spirit and whatever he's calling us to do. So go back to verse 2. Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Uh, holy, acceptable. But once again, this to be is in italics. We're not called to be saints. God doesn't call us and say, hey, I want to save you now. Go out and work it out. Go out there and become a saint. No, he saves me. I am a saint. Hallelujah. St. George. Hallelujah. I didn't do it. God did it. I can go out there and try to be St. George all I want. I, it'll never happen. God does it. Now, when it happens, and God sanctifies me, that word means holy too. Sanctify means holy. That's what we're talking about today. It means to be set apart for God. When I'm sanctified, then I want to be used of God. It's, it's like those holy vessels that they, that they sanctified and put them in that tabernacle. To worship God. Those were vessels. The pots and the pans, even the candlesticks. The, everything was to be made holy, separated, set apart for God. And, and it was supposed to be clean and washed and purified and, and all that stuff because it was going to be used in their worship of God. And that's what you and I are supposed to be. We're holy vessels. And we're, we're to clean ourselves. God cleans us, but then we're, we're, we're to try to live that life. These vessels were holy because they were used to and for the glory of God. In the same way, we as Christians are to be used to and for the glory of God. We should be dedicated for worship, as were these instruments in the tabernacle. In verse 30, it says that Christ Jesus of this chapter, Christ Jesus has become our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. Christ is our sanctification. I never sanctify myself. God sanctifies me. God sets me apart for his service. I, 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 I'm in position because God put me there. It's a work of God. We cannot do it. I know you've heard this many times, but I think it falls on deaf ears sometimes. The Bible says that, 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 that if we're allowing God to work in us, then we're actually, our, 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 our lives. Our lives are being cleaned up. We're drawing closer and closer to God. We're being transformed from one stage of glory, the Bible says, to another stage 
of glory. We're becoming more and more like our, our Lord Jesus as we let him take control of our vessels and he uses, uses us. You know what? Here it is in a nutshell. You and I cannot go to heaven until we get perfect. Not without one sin. I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm not even near it. And if you knew me like I know me, you might want to quit listening right now. <laughs> but wait a minute. If I knew you like you know you, <laughs> I might want to shut you out too. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that is not an excuse to keep on sinning. That's all we want to say today. Well, I'm a sinner. I can't help myself. Yes, you can. God saved you. God anointed you. God sanctified you. God made you holy. You're a holy vessel. He's already done it. But we're still living in the flesh. He's done it in eternity, in essence. He saved us for all eternity, but, but we're still in the flesh, and we need to allow him to continue to work into us, work in us. Uh, it's a position that he's made us. You, if, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're sanctified. You're redeemed. You're justified. You're set apart. You, you have righteousness. You know what? You're as saved right now as you're going to be saved 100 years from now. You can't add to it. God saved you once and for all. That's it. He saved you. You can't add anything to it. Jesus died on the cross, and it says here in verse 30 that he has become our sanctification through faith. However, if you and I are set apart if we're sanctified, if we're made holy, then God will use us. And your desire and my desire should be to be used of God. We need to desire to be poured out like a drink offering, a sacrificial offering, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy. Paul said, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. He was at the end of his life at that time. But we should be fighting the fight and running the race. This is the assurance that you're sanctified. Do you get up in the morning and you want to serve God and you want to serve Jesus and you want him to take control of your life or are you going to wait for Sunday to do that? You know, that, that, that's my assurance that I'm saved. The, the word of God says it. If I will trust in him and believe in him, then I will be saved. And then I have these desires to serve God that I would not have if, if I was not saved. This is my assurance you know, if you don't desire to be used of God, I doubt that you're truly saved. I didn't say you got to do it all the time and do it perfectly. I said, that's your desire. And it grieves you when you grieve the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in Him. I love that verse. God's already planned it out, got it figured out. All I got to do is just yield myself, submit. Well, we don't like that word today, do we? I got to submit to God. That's why Paul teaches us in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, you offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable duty, your reasonable worship, this word could be translated. The, the way we worship God is to present ourselves a living sacrifice. And do not be conformed. That means holding nothing back. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who renews your mind? Jesus. You've got to spend some time with him, though, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Galatians 2 Boy, th th this sums it up. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul, Paul knows he's not crucified with Christ, 
because he's still alive and walking around in a body. But in his heart, he's crucified with Christ. It's by faith. And he's willing to do it, and he ultimately did do it. He died for the cross, for, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're a Christian today, if God has sanctified you, if God has made you holy, you don't go, go out and do what you feel like doing. That stopped. You act on faith in what God has said in his word. That's why you can't keep this closed up. I repeat once more that one, of, one you or I, are not a saint on the basis of what you or I do. It's on the basis of what God does for you and me. But if you are a saint, if you are holy, and God has sanctified you, you are set aside for good works. Something should be happening. You and I should be bearing some fruit. These Christians in Corinth, as we're going to read on further, do not appear to be acting like saints. The work of the Holy Spirit's not being evident in their lives. God says in one place, because they're not following him, some of them are weak, some of them are sick, and some of them are dead. Because they're not following Jesus. They're not acting like saints. But Paul says that they were sanctified by Jesus. Who all, who, with, with, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That, that's the grace of God. Why in the world God puts up with us? You know why God puts up with us? He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. Amen, amen. Paul closes his, his salutation today. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are saved, if we are saved, by the grace, by the unmerited favor of God. It's a gift of God. This morning we all need to ask ourselves, are we saved? Are you sanctified? Are you set apart? Are you a holy vessel? Are you set aside? Are you being used up in your service to God? Please pray with me. Oh, Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, it, it convicts me every time. Lord, it, it causes me to yearn and want to be more like you. Oh, Lord God, thank you for your word. It's, it's truth. Lord, your truth will set us free. Lord, if anybody's in bondage today here in this sanctuary because they have not surrendered to your truth, submitted to your truth, Lord, then I pray today that they will be set free. Lord, if it means we need to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you, then I pray that we will do it. Well, if anything is separating us from that, from that dynamic power of the resurrection lifestyle that you have for us, Lord, reveal that to us today. I want to live that lifestyle. Lord, if people call me crazy, people call me a Jesus freak, it, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm doing it out of love, as, as long as your Holy Spirit's leading me, I do not want my flesh to take over in all this. I don't want to become self-righteous. I, I want my righteousness I want to realize my righteousness comes from you. I cannot impute it to myself. So, Lord, I pray today, if anybody's here, they've never given their life or their heart to Jesus Christ, I pray they would do that right now. So simple. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God so loved the world that he uh, gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to anybody here who's not saved, Lord, you have to call them. I can't call them. I, I can sit up here and talk another half hour. And, Lord, unless you work in it, it, it doesn't do any good. But, Lord, you tell me to preach the gospel. And so that's what I'm trying to do the best I can. But, Lord, you've got to touch their heart, Lord. And, Lord, I know you desire all people to be saved and come to the truth. So I pray today, Lord, whoever is in here who does not know you, Lord, that they would just surrender it to you right now and give it to you. And then, Lord, that they would tell somebody. 
and come down here to the front of this altar and tell uh, someone, tell me, or, or tell someone. Uh, Lord, that's what I did when I got saved. I went, went and told one of my best friends, Ann, Ann Wilkerson, uh, that, that God had done something in my life. And just, oh, just telling her that reassured that what I had done was right. You did that, God. You do it all. So, Lord, today, help us who are sanctified and set apart, Lord, to live like it, to allow you to fill us, for, allow you to do the good works through us. Help us to be an empty vessel. Lord, we make our prayer now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Lord in our hearts each and every day. That's what it means that, 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 that we love him so much. Uh, Ricky and I were reminiscing about Nathan Hales and uh, how during the Christmas cantata, he says his hands just went up to praise the Lord. If y'all were here, y'all saw his hands raised up and unabashedly. He kept them raised for a long time. But I was also reminded, Nathan was just telling me this a few weeks ago, that uh, right after he got saved, he'd been to Potter's Wheel, and he came back to church. We were meeting down in the old building then, and uh, at the end of this service, uh, Nathan was wanting to be used of God, and he was saying that, uh, you know, he was a new Christian uh, and everything, and at the end of the service, I called on him to pray. He said he was not expecting that. He said it really blew him out of the water, but he did. Praise he prayed. Praise God. So I'm going to call on somebody to pray today. Uh, might shake them up, but I know they can do it because I know they love God. I'm going to ask my brother Joey to pray us out of here today. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for all you do for us, Lord bringing us here together as a family. I feel this is a family. I pray that we would treat each other like a family, Lord. We are your family. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for what Nathan had meant to us and all he had done, dear Lord, and all the joy he had spread. And Dear Lord, we just love him. We just thank you for <clears throat> Mildred and Cooper. Be with them, Lord, this morning as they're going through a hard time, Lord. But I just pray we wrap ourselves around them and give them what they need. Lord, we love you. We, we thank you for George and the message he brought this morning. He's bringing it to us, Lord. He's, he's not worried about his job, evidently. We, just, we thank you that thank you that he's coming here and telling us like it is and what we need to hear. Now, bless us as we go forward, as we go through this week. I pray we all keep this message on our heart as we get up every morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.